All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for coming on time. Um, what I want to do in this Science in Action series is shift the focus a little bit. Uh, we've been talking a bit about some of the cooler microbiome side, cellular side science that you could do. And I want to shift the focus a little bit to um, the power that the microbiome platform offers on the virus side. And while much of the stories I will tell you are related to the oceans, uh, I will just say that this kind of work that we're pioneering in the oceans uh, is adaptable to humans. And we've got three different funded projects looking at viruses that infect microbes in humans and uh, also in soils or any kind of environment, extreme environments, ice, et cetera. So it's a really exciting time to study viruses. This is really a lot of firsts and, um, and it's powered a lot by um, this logo here, the Emerge Biology Integration Institute, which is an NSF funded uh, biology integration institute here, led here at Ohio State, but involving 12 different institutions. So where we're gonna go today is, is just start with sort of why we should even bother studying viruses, particularly viruses that infect microbes in natural systems. Uh, and then as I hinted, we'll focus a lot on the oceans, both using what we call our Viromics toolkit and how that points us to specific follow-on experimental testing in virus infection model systems that we call viro cells, the virus infected cell being a virus cell. And then uh, I'll spend the last third or so of the talk really trying to give you the context for why I feel you have big differentiators here at Ohio State for studying viruses in um, complex systems. So why should we care about uh, viruses? Uh, it turns out that nobody really cares about viruses unless they infect a human. And so I usually tease a lot of my students and postdocs and say, no one cares about your virus, so focus on the kinds of microbes that they impact or the kinds of metabolisms that they impact or their evolutionary stories or ecological stories. So, but microbes are important and viruses that might infect these microbes could be important. We, we hear a lot about the human microbiome, uh, the microbes in our body, which impact a lot of who we are. Um, we hear about pathogens and the commensals that protect us against pathogens, so in the context of human disease. But we hear a little less about, and we're starting to learn a lot about, particularly in programs on campus like the Foods for Health program, about how diet and microbes that break down your diet, your foods that you intake, can impact your moods, your behavior, um, and a lot of what we think about as being human. Beyond uh, human health and the human microbiome, there are microbes all around us uh, in soils. As an example, microbes can modulate nutrients and feed plants. They can also be pathogens that infect those plants. Um, and in the oceans, there are microbes that produce about half of the oxygen that we breathe. Um, so half the oxygen on the planet comes from uh, marine microbes. And, and these microbes are also really important because the oceans impact uh, climate change and have halved how much carbon dioxide sits in the atmosphere, that is actually a physical chemical process. The oceans absorb that carbon dioxide just by mass action, but the fate of that carbon dioxide is dictated by microbes. So do the microbes use that carbon dioxide and produce biomass and sink out or stay in the surface waters? And so the climate change sponge that is the global ocean um, is really driven by uh, the, the marine microbes that live there. And, and so my lab's real effort is to try to ask questions related to viruses that infect all these important microbes in humans or soils or in the air or in, in uh, the oceans and try to figure out what could, how could viruses impact microbial metabolisms and microbial ecological dynamics. This is a picture of uh, the planet, and you can see a lot of it is the ocean. And so we're gonna focus a lot today on the oceans. Uh, and when I started my research lab, we're, we're really interested in, in the impact of these viruses. And in particular, we found that <clears throat> at the time, uh, there were viruses in the oceans and there were a lot of them. So this is a DNA staining of uh, cells from seawater and viruses from seawater that are collected on a filter. And the big dots are cells and the little dots are viruses. And, and that's great because it helped us realize that there's numbers like a lot of viruses, 50 million viruses in a mouthful of seawater. 
Um, we can realize that because we can't grow most of these microbes, that we have to look at the viruses using culture-independent approaches. And at the time we started, there was a total of 39 viruses um, that infect microbes who'd been sequenced for whole genomes. If you do experiments in the seawater, you can see that about one in three cells are killed per day, so they're important for mortality. You can also see that they play a role in moving genes around. This is transduction. So viruses can capture random DNA from one microbial host and move it to another. And this could be a niche defining factor. Antibiotic resistance is an obvious case that's been well documented where viruses can move antibiotic resistance genes from one host to another. And so a big challenge was how do we go from counting dots to really understanding the role that viruses play in complex ecosystems? So as I mentioned, very few of these microbes and therefore viruses can be, uh, can be isolated and grown in the lab. And so we used approaches uh, that were sequence-based. And when I started my group, there was this uh, sailboat called the Tara and a group of scientists that rallied around the Tara to sail around the world in the top left um, for about three years, stopping at all these different sites around the world uh, to, to sample the global oceans. And they sampled it in a very standardized manner using metagenomics, metabarcoding, and metatranscriptomics. And they assessed not just viruses, but eight orders of magnitude of, of ocean biota. So basically the plankton, which are the floating organisms in the sea. And what was exciting about this is, is it meant we got a first look in any seawater, any drop of seawater, at all these organisms at once. So a real ecosystems biology approach to studying not just sort of which viruses are there, but what role could viruses play in, um, in that ecosystem. And um, I'm going to summarize a lot of that work in a handful of slides uh, to just try to give you big picture ideas uh, about what you can do with this kind of technology. So specifically, we're using DNA viromics or viral metagenomics to get beyond counting dots here, this image that we started from. And the first thing that we had to do was develop quantitative systematic approaches to looking at these data sets, which we now have. Um, and when we use these, 99% of what you'll see in any new ecosystem is going to be new, never been seen by science. And so your first effort is going to be collector's curves or just identifying what kind of viruses are there. And so you can see this number here in the global oceans. Um, at the time I made this slide, we had 200,000 viral species. And I, I do actually use that word formally. We've tested that very carefully with population genetic tools. And that number now is 579,000 um, viral species. So, so if you go into a new ecosystem, your first question will simply be what viruses are there. Um, it turns out viral taxonomy is complicated, not just the species level, but other levels of taxonomy would be interesting. And that's a major challenge for viral taxonomists because they didn't have a genome-based taxonomy. So we developed machine learning and AI approaches to actually look at gene sharing as a, as a global metric for studying viruses uh, in their genome sequence space. And so now we have approaches currently that are published that look at the genus level virus taxonomy and a new version three of the tool that we've developed that looks at hierarchical taxonomy. So what does that mean? We had 39 genomes and actually beyond the oceans, we had a total of 2000 genomes of these viruses that infect microbes. And so we first just grew the databases, these catalogs, 30,000 in the first adventure, 200,000 in the second adventure. And we now with a paper we just submitted have a total of 579,000. Uh, DNA virus species. And so we see many more contigs or many more genotypes, but we like to organize all of our sequence data into biologically meaningful units. And so we've really worked hard to establish those and to develop those so that data can be intercomparable across systems. The next step was we wanted to look at the genomes. And the story there was, um, it turns out viruses encode AMGs or auxiliary metabolic genes. So let's figure out what that means. Essentially, we'd seen from cultures that viruses that infect cyanobacteria, a photosynthetic cell in the oceans, 
steal photosynthesis genes. And, and this was pretty well worked out before viral metagenomics using culture-based model systems. And so what was happening there was really important, um, as Paul Fokowski captured in this quote. Viruses actually could take this photosynthesis gene and it could change in them. And so he said, small changes in the efficiency of one pathway can alter planetary chemistry. And he was speaking specifically about this work of viruses and cyanobacterial photosynthesis genes. So what does that look like? Um, this is the Z scheme of photosynthesis. Uh, you may remember from biochemistry. And you have one photosystem that passes electrons through a series of electron donors and receptors to another photosystem. And then that goes on to biomineralization reactions. What's interesting is um, you can excite that electron. And at the first photosystem, you can split water to make oxygen and hydrogen. Pretty important processes. Four Nobel Prizes, one studying this right here. And um, you can have another photon of light, which can excite the electron to pass along that electron flow um, to, for example, ferrodoxin. And I've highlighted here the names of genes that viruses have stolen. You'll note viruses in their genomes don't have all the genes in the photosystem. So they're not trying to make a whole new photosystem. They're actually probably randomly sampling the host genome because viruses mispackage DNA. But the genes that stay in the virus genomes are those that cause uh, a fitness advantage. And so here we've got um, PSBA. This is the core reaction center protein that um, turns over on the scale of a half an hour uh, in any given photosynthetic cell because of this. This oxygen formation can lead to oxygen radicals, which can damage that protein. We also know that viruses that infect these cyanobacteria need the lights on. They need photosynthesis. If you turn the lights off or you poison the PS2 reaction center with DCMU, you actually won't get viral particles. So we need photosynthesis. The main photosynthesis protein, the core reaction center protein, is destroyed. And these viruses need more than 30 minutes. They need 12 to 18 hours to make particles and lyse the cells. Viruses that infect these cyanobacteria, as any virus um, would, uh, shut down the ability of the host to tr transcribe and translate their own protein. So, so the hypothesis is the virus actually brings along the very gene it needs to boost photosynthesis and keep it going for its own selfish needs. The other genes um, highlighted here in red for PSBD are involved in broad host range viruses. So if you come in and you infect the wrong host, one of your alternative hosts, and you don't have the matching heterodimeric protein in that new genome, you might need to carry the heterodimeric match. Plastocyanin and ferrodoxin are proteins which pull electrons away from the rate limiting steps of protecting these photosystems, PS2 and PS1. And the highlight inducible proteins help stabilize the PS2 reaction center. So again, viruses are randomly sampling the host genomic material and the few genes that might offer a fitness advantage during infection are those that we see fix in the viral genomic populations that we examine in a natural system. Um, when we look beyond uh, photosynthesis genes outside the cultures and start to use viral metagenomics, we actually realized this is everywhere. Viruses manipulate central carbon metabolism, they manipulate sulfur cycling, and they ma manipulate nitrogen cycling. And this is sort of an oceanographer's dream. These are kind of the key things we think about in the oceans the major biogeochemical cycles that fuel the planet. So AMGs are really interesting. Viruses that encode particular metabolisms are very interesting, and we're going to keep going on this. But I do want to just mention a big concern. Any viral metagenome is not pure. And so when you see metabolic genes, it's really important to use a rule set. Um, and we've established a rule set now in the literature for making sure that those metabolic genes are legitimately on viral context and not some other part of the metagenomic uh, data set. And Ajit Pratama was the one who led the standard operating procedures around that. Um, so I, I've long found the auxiliary metabolic genes to be interesting. And so we actually recently looked at a global uh, data set. As I mentioned, now we're at 579,000 viral species. And we just asked some simple questions how many viral populations carry an auxiliary metabolic gene? And we found about one in eight carry them. 
Um, and we also asked the question, how manipulative are they of the global ocean's meta metabolic capability? And so this is a, a keg uh, map of metabolism where the uh, pathways through here are the enzymatic pathways that we might know as central carbon metabolism, energy metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism. And the pathways that are blue here are what are encoded in the microbes from the matched data from our virons. And what we see are that there are about 340 microbial pathways. And this is um, this is a really interesting number because I was recently at a meeting, again, where Paul Fukowski was, this is a Gordon conference uh, this summer. And he's looking at the world's energy flow through electrons as an engineering wiring diagram and he's come to the conclusion that there's about 400 genes related to these pathways that control the energy and electron flow of the planet. And so we're working on trying to compare these two pathway data sets to see if, if the oceans um, line up cleanly with his, his predictions. But it was interesting, those numbers being so close when you're talking about planetary scale uh, analyses. So the key question was, how many of these pathways and which pathways are targeted by viruses? And, and here we've overlaid in red um, those that the viruses target, and they target about um, uh, 130 out of the 340 pathways. And so this is a great sort of first look at, at, at the level of a list, and we're trying to now shift from what we call that list view into a, into a modeling framework. And so for this work, we're working with um, collaborators in France, um, Antoine Regimbeau and, and Damien Avelard, and they have a community metabolic modeling approach. And what's interesting is within that, they can define using the properties of the networks, which metabolic pathways are important. And so this is a plot here showing uh, essentially the abundance or density of any given uh, pathway and that pathway's importance. So as you move to the right on the x-axis, the pathways are more and more important. And then we've done some randomization where the gray are random reactions, the blue are all reactions, and the red are those that are targeted by viruses. And so what's very clear is viruses target important reactions. In fact, some of the most important reactions. Um, you can see this huge hump out here in the more important side of these reactions. And what what is interesting is from Damien's an applied mathematician, from his sort of mathematical framework, he argues that there, this actually means that they control ecosystem stability. And so by manipulating key metabolisms that are particularly important, the metabolic pathways that are particularly important, he invokes viruses as the key to driving ecosystem stability for the oceans. Um, I'm not quite sure I'm comfortable with that just yet, as excited as I would be about that, um, but we're trying to explore that together. And in addition, we're trying to explore which viral populations matter in these systems. So uh, which viral populations and pathways matter. So we've used DNA viromes to be able to catalog the ocean. We've developed analytics to look at taxonomy. We've started to look at their genomes and seen that they have important metabolic genes. Um, what might we do next? And so here is a beautiful example of an advanced ecological analytic that takes Tara Ocean's cruise track, and into the page here is um, carbon flux. So I mentioned the oceans as a key sponge for the carbon dioxide that we humans put into the atmosphere. The red are areas of the oceans where a lot of carbon gets into the ocean and sinks. And the blue are areas of the ocean where not much carbon gets in and sinks. And so we're, we're studying the sinking of carbon here. And this was a novel data set based on imaging-based data, and it's pretty exciting in and of itself, but Tara was uniquely positioned because of that eight orders of magnitude of microbes that were studied, of plankton that were studied, to ask which organisms, viruses, prokaryotes, or microbial eukaryotes, best predict uh, global ocean carbon flux. And, and this might be useful for opening up our understanding of mechanisms driving carbon flux in the ocean. And um, it turned out viruses explained 89% of that variation, and they were the best by far uh, predicting global ocean carbon flux. And, and I, I mentioned this approach, um, it's actually from a 2016 paper, so it's an older analytic, but it leverages both machine learning and ecosystem modeling approaches. And it's important because here we're interested in carbon flux, but you can use it 
in any system to predict your feature of interest. And so you could be interested in cancer. What's the best predictor of cancer? And it gets beyond the pairwise ecological statistical approaches that many groups will use to assess that. And it allows you to screen these information um, in a way that's much more sophisticated. As well, um, I highlight now this VIP portion. It turns out you, um, you, you can use uh, this analytic to be able to study which of the many viruses are most important to that prediction. And I'll come back to that in a second. So what I want you to recognize here is that we have a really good approach now to organize sequence space, even when it's totally unknown, to do population-based science for double-stranded DNA viruses. And all this work actually is put together in one place on a cyber infrastructure, uh, which has got um, iVirus apps and resources. <clears throat> we can also take those VIPs, in this case, it's a handful of very important uh, viruses in those data sets uh, and, and start to do hypothesis-driven testing. And so we've done time-resolved um, multi-omic data sets where we look at infection dynamics that change across various conditions of interest to get a mechanistic understanding of why viruses are driving some of these carbon flux patterns that we're seeing and um, as well sort of how they dictate uh, phage biology. So we study why some cells are efficiently infected and others that are nearly identical are inefficiently infected. We study how modulating the host physiology changes a phage infection. And we study how viruses that infect um, uh, alone versus viruses that infect with and without a grazer are impacted. So cross kingdom interactions. <clears throat> so that was um, viromes to virocells. And I'm just going to spend one slide on RNA viruses because we, we'd focused on DNA viruses to summarize two papers, one that focuses on evolution and one that focuses on ecology. And so the first story mined these global ocean data sets to assess um, the evolutionary patterns and the diversity that existed in the oceans. And what we see here is a global phylogeny of all the RNA virus sequence space that was available at the time. And in gray are the RNA viruses which were known. And so these represent five known RNA virus phyla. And then in the um, redder color are global ocean RNA viruses. And what we actually saw is that in all the five known RNA virus phyla, we see many examples of global oceans. Uh, representatives, and 99% of them all represent novel species. But we also see these additional five phylum level uh, taxa. And so there were five known RNA virus phyla, and now we've added, we think, another five. This is an incredibly controversial tree to make. We actually spent about five years trying to figure out how to do these trees and do them really carefully. It's a big problem in the literature. And so I'll just mention for those that are interested in the evolutionary details, beyond the, the global phylogeny, which is tough to do because of 3 billion years of evolution in this protein, we added in elements um, to assess phylum level support, looking at domain enrichment of the genomic fragments, 3D structures that were predicted from these uh, particular targeted genes, and motifs that were there. As well, an interesting evolutionary story here is that the Tara viracota, which is this large group at the bottom that I forgot to mention, these oceans, uh, these ocean viruses are very widespread and found largely throughout the oceans. They also seem to be a missing link in early evolution of life. And so this exploration of, of global ocean virus sequence space um, allowed us to really change how we think about RNA viruses in, in natural systems and even in all the human known systems. And then on the ecological side, we can do some of our more standard ecological approaches. We can measure their ecological community structure and drivers. We can assess the auxiliary metabolic genes that they have in their genomes. We can also assess in that machine learning and ecosystem modeling framework um, how carbon flux is impacted. And it turns out there are also strong signals of carbon flux for RNA viruses, probably infecting microbial eukaryotes. And we've got a punch list of 11 VIPs that we want to try to target and follow up on. So hopefully that demonstrates a little bit of the kinds of things that you could learn in a system and, and really disentangle how viruses may be impacting ecosystems at a very high level 
um, hopefully right at the heart of key metabolisms or um, key microbes you might care about in your system. Why do I think you can do great things here um, much easier than you can anywhere else? Um, at a broad level, we just have a lot of really exciting microbiome science here at Ohio State, and particularly genome-resolved microbiome science. You'll see later, I'll make one slide case about, um, about the value of that. And, and at Ohio State, the differentiators here are, we have actually quite a long history of studying microbiomes. In, in 1997, there was a DOE-funded and NSF-funded course, summer course here, that started looking at microbial communities before the word microbiome was even common parlance. So we've long been studying microbiomes here uh, and at OSU across a breadth of ecosystems. So everything from soils and complex environmental systems to humans, oceans, air, um, there's even studies in cockroaches and in space. So there's lots of different ecosystems being studied. The microbes are not just studied as a microbe or a microbiome, they're studied really with a broad ecosystem context. So how do you understand the microbes role in a broader ecosystem? And then the other key differentiator, which I'll spend a bit of time on, is this microbiome platform, which is a, a shared and a shared product that is really the center of microbiome science, working with um, the Applied Microbiology Services Lab and the Infectious Disease Institute to try to democratize these capabilities in a really strong way to allow all of you to focus on the science of your system rather than working through how to get data out. So as I mentioned, at microbiome science is, is really um, strong here. It's leveraged by the Center of Microbiome Science, the Microbial Communities Program of IDI, this Emerge Biology Integration Institute that I mentioned earlier. There's also an Ocean Chemistry Science and Technology Center that we're part of. Um, and we've got now over in the Medical Center, uh, the Pelotonia Research Center, a microbiome neighborhood where we're trying to grow expertise on the medical microbiome side. So why is it that OSU's microbiome science is actually that different or exciting? And I think it's really it comes down to this, um, this ecosystems biology approach. So, so most microbiome scientists will study a microbial community and use a PCR-based approach to target using a gene, um, amplicon-based pictures of microbiomes. And so you might get pictures that are related to a 16S tree for taxonomy, or you might get abundance at some level, um, the phylum level down to maybe the genus or even species level. And you may assess richness and how that changes across the system. But that doesn't let you ask, that lets you ask who questions, who is there, but it doesn't let you ask mechanistic questions. And so one of the exciting things about the microbiome platform is we're layering in this component. What's the genomic context when we sequence a metagenome for that gene? And that genomic context gives us not only niche-defining functions like antibiotic resistance, it also gives us the ability to measure um, DNA viruses, for example. Viruses lack a 16S gene, so they'll never show up or be part of the stories when you use an amplicon-based approach. Another element is um, we're now starting to build out metatranscriptomic capabilities, the ability to sequence RNA and study which genes are expressed which metabolic pathways might be active, whether DNA viruses are active, whether micro, which microbes are active, and to do the RNA virus discovery like what I just showed you from the global oceans. Another differentiator is when you get those data, there's a, a large learning curve to figure out how to analyze those data. And so we built into the microbiome platform, um, layering in uh, a lot of processing steps to get to making the pairwise ecological studies simpler. And we're working on opening up the more complex approach that I mentioned, the ecological modeling machine learning approach. And the reason that's exciting, again, is that you can take the thousands of taxa that you're observing and filter it down to the few that really matter for whatever you care about. I mentioned ocean carbon flux. It could have been predicting cancer or product yield or crop yields. This is sort of where we're at currently right now. We're really focused on building out our metagenomic capability and the processing steps to infer data from that. And I'll unpack that a little bit in the next slide. Um, but I wanna emphasize, we're gonna to continue to try to build in um, metatranscriptomics currently, as well as these other statistical modeling approaches. I will probably not go into it unless the question's asked, but 
I will emphasize that 16S is a slow evolving gene. It's excellent for asking questions that if you're interested in traits which are ancient. Okay, so central carbon metabolism genes are not very prone to horizontal gene transfer. And those kinds of analyses or traits might be um, evolving at the same rate as the 16S gene. But other genes, and one I care about, is virus susceptibility. Viruses and their ability to infect the cell or not is a rapidly evolving trait because of the arms race, the virus host arms race, where cells are constantly trying to defend against predation by viruses. And so you can't predict any viral biology from a 16S gene. In fact, most of the things which drive ecological community structure are traits that evolve much faster than the 16S gene, even when you do single um, uh, nucleotide variants or ASVs in, in 16S data. And so the value of metagenomics is to have that broader genomic context to really assess fast evolving ecologically relevant traits. So this platform um, is now able to do uh, what we call an analytical workflow for genome resolved metagenomics. And to sort of at a high level tell you about that, it allows us to take raw reads, clean them, make assemblies, and then for microbes, bend those contigs into metagenome assembled genomes and take those meta metagenome assembled genomes or mags and functionally annotate them as well as place those functional annotations in the metabolic pathway context. You can also then take those mags and look at taxonomy. Uh, and with the taxonomic data that you have, um, establish abundances per taxon and use those abundance data to ask ecological or evolutionary questions. On the virus side, um, we can predict viruses in actually virus targeted or virus like particle uh, metagenomic sequencing or from bulk data. So if you've done a bacterial targeted metagenomic sequencing project, you probably already have a great virus story in your data. Those viruses can be assessed taxonomically, um, which can mean that you can then map their abundances and do ecological and evolutionary analyses. You can also assess the viruses for their auxiliary metabolic genes to know what kinds of metabolisms they're targeting. And you can do host prediction to figure out which microbes that they're impacting. And I'll just emphasize that this is an incredibly um, influx process. And what you have here at Ohio State, thanks to this partnership between comms, the IDI, and the Applied Microbiology Services Lab, is an effort to try to keep this workflow incredibly up to date. At any number of these steps, there are tools that get invented. In fact, just one yesterday came out for virus identification, but it looks like it's the new cool tool we should use. So these are constantly evolving steps. And so rather than every lab individually trying to keep up with a very dense literature, we're trying to do that in this centralized way through the microbiome platform. And beyond this sort of more basic standard processing, data processing, um, we are trying to develop future capabilities. I mentioned metatranscriptomics. We're exploring the idea of creating data pools so that my metagenome assembled genomes could help someone else's data set if their data are different. We're also trying to work on bringing in some of the Emerge Biology Integration Institute's additional capabilities in RNA viruses and mobile genetic elements. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, bringing in advanced ecological stats as a more standard analysis and developing long read analytics. This is really cheap because of the Ohio supercomputer and all the work that, um, that AMSL has done to develop this workflow on the Ohio supercomputer. We're guesstimating about $12 per sample if you only care about microbes and about $7, $17 per sample if you care about microbes and the viruses. So this used to be, I would hand a PhD student raw reads and about two years later, they would have struggled to be able to get all this to work because it was a really complicated system. And now at Ohio State, you can have um, two data analysts that can run these data through and provide a lot of these process data to a very, very mature state. Um, I wanna just spend a minute or two on the Center of Microbiome Science and uh, mention that it is here for you to really empower microbiome science broadly. Our mission is to empower microbiome science for researchers that wanna do um, 
design or prediction of microbial communities and any of those broad ecosystem types that we have here at OSU. We were founded just a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic started, and we've grown quite rapidly to more than 100 faculty across nine colleges. And the vision of the center is to advance microbiome science through what we call the four C's. So we try to make compute simple, as we just described from that workflow. We try to centralize capabilities through this microbiome platform. We're trying to elevate the existing curriculum that's happening across campus so that more students know about the cool microbiome science classes already being taught. And we're establishing community. And this is really important. We've been able to attract significant funds from the NSF for the environmental microbiome work, particularly focused on multiomics data integration and microbiome modeling. Um, at NIH, we've been doing really well when we support any level of grants, Ks, T32s, R01s, we're, we're really helping um, with the Genome Resolve Microbiome Science uh, grants at NIH review very well. In the United States, uh, we have an advanced position now in the Microbiome Centers Consortium. This is the directors of all the microbiome centers across the U.S., and we're leadership in that consortium. And we run international viromics workshops to learn in more detail about some of the stuff that I told you about today. The real reason that I do it all, though, is this community part. Um, I try to make sure to get to socials. We have a social once a month for the faculty and about two weeks after that, once a month for the All Center. We also have work in progress seminars that um, we send anyone interested in microbiome to the IDI's work in progress seminar series. And we have working groups where um, trainees lead really hands-on discussions about struggles that other trainees might be having. This is an office hour um, that happens once a week and the details are on the comms website. Very pragmatically, that means that there's unique in the world training here through that training tra track, the work working group support, and um, a broader microbiome informatics webinar series, which details some of the hands-on elements. We also have this microbiome platform. I didn't emphasize it, but it's really helped bring down sequencing costs here in Columbus. And we're going to continue to try to bring those costs down as we grow usership. So I expect in a year or two, the costs will be significantly reduced as usership grows and we keep working on downsizing our reagent conditions. Um, as I mentioned, we've got these advanced data analytics services. Those are really unique. We don't know of any other examples and any other system that, um, that any sequencing center that can run genome resolve microbiome data through like this. And we do have the capability for really tough samples. Um, this isn't sort of regularly done yet at the microbiome platform. But we have gotten quantitative metagenomes from 100 femtograms of DNA in the oceans. We've also gotten quantitative metagenomes from ice, um, crystal clear, not able to see anything in it, ice, and so non-detectable amounts of DNA. So don't give up if you have a tough sample. Um, you'd be surprised at how sensitive these techniques can be. And then the other support is really at the grant support level. We don't expect everybody to be a microbiome researcher. We're hoping that microbiome measurements become another standard measurement in your toolkit. A lot of people have great research programs. Um, we would love to be a microbiome AIM-3 in your research grant. I run a course every fall, and we have currently five pilot groups going through. This is a team of students who would focus on your research and your data to try to bring out um, maybe the key figure you need to write your first microbiome grant, or three figures that turn into a paper. Actually, a student from last year, just a month ago, had a Nature Communications paper published on the work that they started in the class. Um, we also run a proposal cohort where we try to work with a handful of scientists, researchers that would like to write a proposal in the next year. So you have a group of people that you meet with just monthly to be able to go through the steps of writing a proposal. Um, and we're currently collecting starter grant materials. So uh, if you are interested in writing a grant but don't even know where to start, these might help um, get you started. And then if you want to emphasize the Center of Microbiome Science and what we can do to support you, because you think that'll be competitive in your grant, we have provided many letters of support to help people get um, that sort of substance added to their grants. So, and this is my last slide, um, what I hope you see today is that uh, we've shifted our understanding from sort of counting dots um, to being able to now study uh, 
now quantitatively study um, and bring names to these different virus dots. So quantitative sampling to be able to assess virus communities. That's allowed us to develop these global catalogs of hundreds of thousands of virus species. We can assess those catalogs with machine learning and gene, gene sharing networks to be able to assess their taxonomy now hierarchically. We've studied these genomes to re reveal that viruses directly manipulate key metabolisms like photosynthesis, carbon cycling, sulfur cycling, nitrogen cycling. And we've added viruses into the ecosystem's picture to ask which biological entities are impacting, in this case, ocean carbon flux, and viruses ended up being the driving factor. This analytic allows us to also see which of those viruses are the driving factor, and all these capabilities are available through iVirus on a, a, a public server infrastructure, as well as the OSU microbiome platform. We're just about to release that workflow uh, broadly, and, and you can also pay to use it for pay to use it through the microbiome platform services. Those VIPs from this um, ecosystem analysis can actually lead to hypothesis testing that you can do in the laboratory. Uh, I mentioned the time resolved multiomic analyses of virus cells or virus infected cells. And you can do this at the DNA virus and now RNA virus level, where we've doubled the number of known RNA virus phyla from five to 10, and use that to understand deep evolutionary events and ecology. There are auxiliary metabolic genes that they're using uh, to manipulate cells. Uh, and we've identified 11 RNA viruses as the key players in ocean carbon flux. And while I focused on the oceans, we have similar stories building now in humans and soils that demonstrate the power and importance of studying viruses as part of the ecosystems you probably all care about. The funding for this work is listed here, and I'd like to particularly thank the Tar Oceans Consortium, um, who have brought all these amazing samples to our lab to be able to do this kind of work, as well as long, um, the 15 years now of interacting with them to really push the science and the envelope uh, in what we can do. And I'd particularly like to thank uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who funded early on some pretty crazy ideas that really did pan out and I think helped a lot, and DOE and, DOE and NSF, who fund um, our programmatic support broadly. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, Mike. I don't think so. Is this good? Okay. So, great talk, Matt. Thank you. Um, so one of the it was it was pretty striking to me. I'm I'm gonna just gonna focus on the double stranded DNA virus uh, part. And I'm I'm gonna it, the the depth of the catalog that you've you've kind of assembled in terms of numbers of species. I think the last number you said was like over five hundred thousand. So that's a big number. And, and it looks like that number has grown pretty rapidly in a pretty short time. I think it was like, I know it was 200,000 before, and I think there was a step before that was much smaller than that. 30,000. What? So first question is, what has contributed to that growth? Is it just more data or is it is it advances in the analytics, kind of the same data, but advances in the analytics that has changed that? So I think that's that's the first question. And then another question is, that's a big number, and then that's just focused on oceans, right, on, on ocean water. So have there been very many comparable efforts in other habitats, or is it just there's so much more out there that we just haven't cataloged at all? Yeah, there, I mean, there's constant virus discovery. So you've got tens of thousands that just came out in that student's paper from last year in the Rumen. Um, you've got 30,000 that became 200,000 in humans from just mining the trash of human microbiome gut data. Um, and in soils, it's probably in the tens of thousands, 40, 50,000, I'd say, across papers. What's led to that growth is really just new sample exploration. During that time, it's been pretty consistently Illumina sequencing. So the technology has changed a little in scale. We've gotten deeper data, and that has helped. The definition of that species has been solid from the beginning. So that's been a pretty robust early on since 2016 definition. So the analytics aren't really driving that. It's It's been new data, new ecosystems. And so that will continue to grow quite a bit, which is why the idea of the data pool at something like OSU, where we have lots of ecosystems, could have great value. And if we can sort of coordinate that and think about good ways to not hurt somebody's ability to do discovery in their own data, but to be able to grow everybody else's ability to see stuff at the same time, that, that'll be great. Yeah, it's exciting. Thanks. Vanessa? 
So all the viruses that you are focused on or cataloging are all infect bacteria, right? Am I understanding that right? The RNA viruses drags me out of the bacteria world, but yes, I'm by okay. by comfort, I'm a phage guy. Yes. Okay. Well, I I was just curious is is there a story of viruses affecting some of the um, macro uh, uh, organisms in in the community that you haven't even explored yet, or are others looking at at that aspect? For sure, eukaryotic viromics is understudied, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Um, Currently in soils, um, we have a pretty strong RNA microbial eukaryote, RNA virus microbial eukaryote story. Um, but you could imagine that those are underexplored. Generally speaking, the eukaryotic viruses will be more strongly RNA. And, and so you're going to need to look for those not in the traditional data sets that we make for metagenomics. You'd look for those in the metatranscriptomics. In fact, the two papers of RNA virus, that, that was actually two-year-old metatranscriptomic data that we were mining. So it was out there in the public, just looked at in a new way. <clears throat> Anyone online? I, I did work hard with Mike's help. Thanks, Mike, to try to bring you actual numbers for that cost per sample for what that cool workflow computation would would cost. So the we're somewhere around. So I thought that might be a, a number that people would be interested in hearing. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly, I think those are the costs that are kind of our computational storage costs, not so much time and personnel would come into that, but yeah, that's that's where we, we landed based on a number of assumptions. <laughs> uh, it's certainly incredibly valuable to be partnering with OSC and you know that that connection comms and OSC and and AMSL to to make that happen. That's comms has certainly played a big role in that. It's it's nice to not have to worry about the supercomputer maintenance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that, that, sure. a valuable resource. I don't know how many folks online realize that. That is another piece that I underemphasize, but Mike has just emphasized in his question that we do have a really powerful supercomputer. I I was at MIT for ten years, and I'm more impressed with our Ohio supercomputer resources here, at at value and um, the hardware that we need for microbiome science in particular, the high memory nodes, the large storage nodes. So it's it's really well tuned for microbiome, and, and not only the the capacity, but the support that's there is is mm -hmm. quite good. Any questions online? All right. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Appreciate you all taking the time, and I hope you look for viruses in your data sets. Thanks.